Well, it's been four years since I've been with my friends from Photo TV in the audience. It's good to be back. I'd like to share with you some things that have happened to me photographically in the past four years and some new thoughts. Four years is a long time in this world. Photographically, technique, technology, economy has changed our ways of thinking. Some of us have had to learn how to reinvent ourselves because of technology and digital work. The economy, cultures change, and you might see an evolution in my work just in the past four years. I spent a lot of time in Europe, a lot of time in France, some time in the Netherlands, and some of the work that we'll see here will show a, maybe a new direction. One of the reasons the work may have changed is I don't really do assignment work anymore. I'm shooting more for myself. The economy and maybe it's just my mentality of my, of my evolution of my career. I prefer to do things for myself more and I seem to, seem to enjoy it more. Uh, I'm not working for an editor, I'm not working for a publisher, a magazine. I go out and I simply respond to what I see. I tend to carry a camera with me everywhere I go now. I never used to do that. I have available to me the finest of equipment the top of the line of, of all the new cameras, but I prefer, I would call them toy cameras sometimes. I tend to prefer the smaller, more manageable, smaller cameras, not the highest resolution all the time. My walk around cameras is, I think, what we say in the business. The ones you can casually, sometimes almost small enough to put in your pocket. But I always have the camera, and I'm finding that I make pictures that I never made before because in the past I used to be so deliberate. I have the assignment, so I get my big boy cameras out, the serious big cameras with the big lenses and the big resolution. And I sometimes think maybe photographers, they wear cameras like jewelry, that I don't care about impressing people anymore, that I have the latest, most expensive camera. I use the camera that works for me. And sometimes they're the small, the second, tier, third tier cameras, small little manageable cameras that can quickly pick up and shoot a quick photograph and then put it away and forget about it. And I'm finding that my imagery is better. Maybe the technique quality in terms of numbers of pixels maybe isn't quite that. But if I do a, a serious piece of work that I'm really, really working on a project, then I will take, I call my big boy cameras out, my the serious big high resolution, state of the art cameras with the big lenses. But a lot of these images that I think that we're seeing here now today might have been made with the lower tier cameras. I have a, a lens that I use for so many things. It's a 28 to 300. It's a small lens, but it covers a great range. So I can walk around with one body. I put a thin black strap so it doesn't show I can, with a black shirt, I put the camera off to my side as though it's invisible. So the D7000 with a small compact lens, the range is uh, quite long. I've been able to capture some special moments. Just this morning I was out shooting and I was quite proud of a couple photographs. I think most people think I'm an amateur. That's another advantage of using lower echelon, lower tier cameras in that most professionals tend to use the top of the line and they look professional. They got two, three cameras hanging and they're clicking away, kind of making a big show of it. Not intentionally, but it seems to be that way. My career, I've always tried to be invisible. And so the small cameras are easy, quick, light. You don't even feel they're on. Uh, and I'm able to gain access to animals sometimes and to people because I'm just not making such a fussy vibration. That's very crucial, I think, to photography, whether it's people or animals, sometimes even trees, if trees have some kind of a sense of knowing you're there. I'm never quite sure about that, but walk gently and, and move slowly, I think that uh, somehow has, helps my work. That ability to move quickly, have a small camera without having a big box of cameras. I have sometimes two or three lenses with me, but I put them in my pocket. 
I'll carry the zoom lens, the 28 to 300 on my camera, kind of hidden behind my arm as I walk either the streets or even in the, in the, in the forest. Uh, so they're not bouncing around. And then if I want an extreme wide angle, I'll go with, say, a small 20 millimeter f2.8. Very tiny little lens that fits in my pocket. Today we're in Iserlohn in Germany at an exhibition that's traveling around Europe. And uh, we're going to be talking about some of my European photographs that we've just recently shown and made. This is a photograph I made maybe three years ago, perhaps a year after I saw you last. And this is one of the few photographs, I might say, that I don't remember exactly where I made it. I was traveling down the highway in a hurry. I looked back over my shoulder and I saw a foggy scene of a castle and I saw a lot of crows flying. And I quickly pulled off the side of the road, used a long, a long lens. I can't remember what lens this was. I think it could have been a 500. I don't remember. It's very rare I don't remember. My uh, data will show on the frame. Uh, but I maybe spent 10 minutes shooting out the window of the car, I believe, and I shot it very quickly, and I quickly forgot about it. And it's one of those images that you discover in editing that you didn't think about much when you shot it. I love those surprises. As I get older and more experienced, I find that happens less often. I usually can tell when I'm making something if it has strong potential. This was a surprise, and I love surprises. And that's about all I have to say. It just creates a sense of a depth with the crows flying through. And of course, to the American eye, we don't have castles in America. We're too young. So Americans love to have chateaus and castles, the old European romance. So there's some of the American bias showing up here. This is very romantic to American eyes. I'm not sure if it is to European eyes. You see castles everywhere in Germany, France, all through Europe. But I've been surprised at the popularity of this photograph in my galleries in America. It's been quite a popular image. I've spent a lot of time in the Netherlands this past two, three years. And I happened upon a a very interesting game refuge, a, a park, like a national park, Ostvandenplasse. They have the old, old horses from Europe. The biologists have tried to take the genetic strain back as far back as they can get. And they found some horses, I think, in Poland, conic horses. And they're trying to create this landscape from old Europe. Uh, not with necessarily the typical animals of the moose and the deer and the wolves, but the horses and the cattle, the old cattle, the orc, I think it's called, that you see in the cave paintings in France. The horse and the old cattle are probably the subjects that were painted the most. And that's what I think subconsciously I was thinking about when I made this picture. The first human art was the cave paintings in Lascaux and Chauvet, the caves in France. And since I was a young boy, I've been looking at those paintings and deeply moved by them. And, and we all know that we're all influenced by something else. The great painters of our time, the Van Gogh and the Picasso's, they would all talk about who influenced them. And I remember one comment in particular by Picasso when he was talking about the cave paintings from 30,000 years ago. He said, we've done nothing new in 30,000 years. Those paintings somehow capture the spirit of life and, and motion and emotion, as, as well as anything done today. And I think, well, that's quite intimidating in 30,000 years. What am I walking around with this camera? So I'm trying to get back. And this reminds me a little bit about the cave paintings. And the older I get, as though I'm probably known as a photographer, I'm very much interested in anthropology, human behavior, cultures. And I think that's important for me 
when I make a picture, there's many layers that go deeper than what that most people might think. It's not just simply thinking of visual things in the frame. I'm thinking of context. When I made this picture, maybe I was thinking of, I love crows, the corvids, the family of the crows and the ravens and the smart, intelligent birds. My American eye saw the, the cultural reference, the old heritage of Europe and the castles. So there's these references that I keep coming up with. And in this case, probably the most important reference I can make of the old horses is, I'm a little obsessed with ancestry. I've gone back to my German heritage and found out that I go back to the 1550s, which is a long time of, for an American to find his roots in Germany. I'm fascinated by it. Not far from where we sit is where my original grandparents came from, just a 45 minute drive from here in Brillen. In the northern part of Germany, near Schleswig, Flensburg, was my other side of my grand, great-grandmother's family. And when I come to that land, I feel something very deep, like a genetic memory is coming back to me. It's kind of beautifully haunting, but it, it moves me and it becomes very emotional inside of me and something comes out. I'm not sure at that moment. But in a reference to this, this is the deepest cultural reference I could ever imagine that I did a genetics test since I saw you last to find out where my heritage was. Not in Germany, not in Norway, which is on my mother's side. So I did some scrapings of my genetic material and passed it on to the scientists and they took my lineage back with this just amazing human genome project they were able to go back 30,000 years and traced my lineage from my family's back. 30,000 years ago, the dot on the world map was at Lesko. This is a tr true story. It's almost unbelievable to me. So it's conceivable that I have a direct, 30,000 years direct, lineage relative that was painting on the caves 30,000 years ago. That is profound to me. It is a little bit scary, spooky, bizarre. And when I do this, 30,000 years later, nothing has changed. I'm still the same, I still have the same appetite. I go out, I make pictures of animals. Not as beautiful as we did 30,000 years ago, um, but it's expressive. The horses are very expressive anyway. These particular horses, the wild horse, has the spirit that you don't see in the more domesticated kind. These are probably the same, genetically almost the same kind of horse that were painted on the cave paintings. And it was, it was important for me to know that. That's the layer that I'm talking about. Context, believing in something, uh, study, that's important to making pictures. I'm, it isn't just pure photography. Sometimes it can be that way, but I'd like to look at every image that we'll look at today, and I can tell you stories that go deeper, very deep, sometimes 10 layers deep. This one is a 1,000 layers deep. How many generations in 30,000 years? Maybe my ancestors painted those cave paintings in Lascaux and Chauvet. Well, so much for the moment. Time is running short, and I'm looking forward to seeing you all again for the next episode.